get to uh, smile at people, minister to them. Um, just an enjoyable time to be able to serve, especially during this season. Uh, don't forget about the 8th, 9th, and 10th of December is Christmas at Jonesboro. 8th is at 7 o'clock. 9th and 10th is at 5 o'clock. Um, it's a long paragraph, so it looks like it's going to be really good. Right, Brother Tom? Have you seen the whole program yet? or No. You never do until through. Oh, okay. So, that's okay. That's all. Okay. That'd be cool to see that. But anyway, 8th, 9th, and 10th, 7, 5, and 5. Um, the church, uh, the schedule for the church, December 20th, no Wednesday night activities. The 24th, Sunday service only. So, I'm assuming it says Sunday service. I'm assuming. Sunday morning service is all we'll have. Um, candlelight service on the 27th at 5 p.m. No Wednesday activities. December 31st, regular schedule. There's a trip being put together for Ukraine <coughs> October 12th, 21st, 20, 2024. What I understand, I haven't read the whole paragraph, but I understand it is a uh, building to be doing some construction. Uh, anybody else got anything to add or any new people have to add to our prayer list? You said the candlelight service was 27? Candlelight service. <coughs> candlelight service, 5 p.m. on 27th. Uh, December 24th, Sunday service only. So just a Sunday morning service. Regular times, I'm assuming. <coughs> so, 24th on Sunday. That's a time. So, it's a time. Okay, I need somebody to clarify that. It's the 24th. What? Can't like, sir? Yes, I saw it on the email. Me too. Well, don't give me bad information. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget about the um, stop in the pantry. For our food pantry here at church, there's a list there. There's a list I can hand out. There's a list you can get it online. I took a picture of it. So we've already got several boxes up here. Um, keep it coming. We can use all we can get in the pantry. Yes, sir. John Blanchard, friend of mine I worked with about 30 years ago in California. My wife had a massive heart attack and died with her four years ago. He had a stroke recently. Talked to him last night and just prayed for the recovery. Okay. Let's pray for him. <coughs> also, I spoke with Henson. I called him yesterday afternoon and said, Let's come by and pick you up. He can live till Thursday. And uh, he, he's, he's, he's in pretty bad shape. Wow. He, can, he can barely walk. Yeah. His feet swell up. And I wouldn't see what, what, what symptoms that was of, and it's all bad. So, so yeah. we called him. We talked about visiting. Okay, so Brother Hen's not doing well. No. And where is he now? He's still with his son. With his son. With his son, son in there. He got the information if you need. Let's continue to pray for um, the Jackson family. We lost Brother Dan this past week and having the service. Anybody else? Can do some prayer? Lord, we do thank you for bringing us together. Lord, for having the opportunity to worship you and to give you the honor and the glory and the praise. Lord, there's nobody like you. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the time that we're coming into, that, Lord, that we can praise you and glorify you. And Lord, we pray that you touch our hearts. And draw each one of us closer to you, O oh God. Fill us with the Holy Spirit and use us for your glory. And Lord, you've heard the request for prayer. And Lord, you know each one. And there's others in the room that, Lord, are hurting this morning. And we pray that you touch those that are here that's sick in their bodies. 
We pray for the healing of their bodies, Lord. And God, we pray that you'd just go with us today. That you'd be with our speaker this morning. That you'd be with Brother Mel during our worship service. Lord, may souls be touched and drawn to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we've got a special, well, we've got two special guests with us. We've got Miss Mary and Billy Thompson that's with us this morning. And uh, we welcome you, Welcome. Well, this is our, I think our second time in this, with our class as a whole that we're going through this book. But uh, some of you have been through uh, the book several times. And uh, every time you go through it, uh, it speaks to your heart. Because the title of it says, The Heart of the Problem. And these old wicked hearts that we have is the problem. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot. I don't know about you, but it takes a lot for me to, to uh, stay right with this old heart of mine. So the more that we read it and the more that we apply it and seek the Lord, the better off we're going to be. But it's an honor to introduce your guest this morning, your guest speaker this morning. Uh, he is an author. He's a teacher. He's a theologian. He's a pastor. He's a doctor of divinity. And many other things. But he doesn't draw a crowd like uh, Allison does. <laughs> She's just better at drawing, drawing crowds. But it's our honor to have Brother Kerry with us again. He's part of us. And he's one of the authors of this book. And uh, we look forward to what you will have to say for us today. Thank you. So, turning your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. <clears throat> this week, if you got through all of your lessons, uh, it was about most of us had a poor start in life. Now, some of you in this room, I'm sure, had worse beginnings than others. Like some of you had to walk to school in the snow, in the snow seven feet deep for 10 miles, and others got on the bus. And came home for lunch. Yeah. But we could, we could find some difficulties with everyone's childhood. True? Yeah. Some could be better than others, but we tend to think the ones that are worse are the ones that have a terrible physical <coughs> environment. And so consequently, we tend to think people, the way they are is determined by their physical environment. Like, some got to go to a good school system and some didn't. Some had good parents and some didn't. Only problem with that is Jesus said, it's not your environment. That's the problem. It's your heart. And everything that comes out of your life comes from your environment. No, your heart. And so we have to keep babbling our own thinking about why we are like we are. Because we keep bringing up the defenses of this is the way I was treated. This is the kind of setting I grew up in. If I'd have had a better school system, if I had had better parents, it's amazing to me, though, when I deal with people 
There are some people that come to me for counseling because they had terrible parents. There are some people that come to me because they didn't have parents. So if they didn't have parents, I mean, they're excused from sin, right? If they had terrible parents, they're excused from their sin, right? No. Now, there's some point in our life <clears throat> Welcome, Richie. I know. <laughs> there, there's some point in our life where we have to stop with the excuses. Now, there's no doubt some people are living in terrible situations. But did you know that I have counseled people who lived in terrible situations that had a wonderful spirit? And I have counseled people, literally, I'm not exaggerating, billionaires who had everything this world can offer except they couldn't sleep at night. Now, your heart is not determined by your background. Now, you may have to overcome some things in your background. But let's look at this Colossians 2, 8. Particularly this first verse. Beware lest anyone... Do what? <clears throat> They're cheating you. How? <laughs> Through philosophy and what? Empty deceit. Okay, do you know what empty deceit is? It's deceit that has no basis for truth. Okay? It's empty. <clears throat> There's nothing you can get out of this. <clears throat> According to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, look at that last phrase, and not according to Christ. Okay, so I want to ask you a couple of questions. Y'all ready? Number one, has something bad ever happened to you? Don't tell me what it is. Just... <laughs> We don't have enough time for that. <laughs> but has something bad ever happened to you? I think everybody could say yes. Now, do you blame that for the struggles in your life? <clears throat> have you ever blamed it for the struggles in your life. Now, we tend to do that, don't we? All right, let's get honest with one another and with ourselves that I wouldn't have reacted this way if they hadn't said that to me. Y'all never thought that before, right? I have. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I wouldn't have acted that way if they hadn't treated me that way. I think all of us have done that. Now, it doesn't mean you don't overcome it. It doesn't mean you don't deal with it. But there's a buzzword in our day that you didn't even hear about 40 years ago. Trauma. That word... You didn't hardly ever hear that except in the emergency room. And now everybody has trauma. And that's the reason you're like you are. That you have this trauma that you went through in your life. Okay, that's empty deceit. Trauma doesn't make you like you are. It reveals what you are. Some of y'all didn't want to hear that. <laughs> but it's true. You see, 
all of y'all, most all of y'all, are old enough to know that in your lifetime, words have come and gone. There's a term that comes up, and it's the hot word for 10 years, 15 years, and then you don't hear it anymore. Um, it's kind of like eggs are bad for you. They were really bad for my 90-year-old granddad. That ate them every day. Today, they're good for you. Again. Okay, trauma is the same way. It's a buzzword. Do not let your mind be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. There are philosophies of men that give you an excuse to feel like you are. It's empty deceit. It's the traditions of men. Now, understand... If you've gone through trauma, it, I'm not saying you should have or you deserved it. What I'm saying to you is Christ is the one who shapes your life, not trauma. So you may have experienced the trauma when you didn't know Christ. But when Christ comes into your life, there ought to be a difference. Listen to this. God's divine power has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1, 3. How much is everything? There's nothing that God's divine power cannot give you to overcome the, quote, traumas in your life. But if you're always talking about trauma, you will always be a victim. But in Christ, there is victory. Amen. We need to change our mindset from the world's traditions concepts and empty deceit to the mind of Christ. Uh, we well, got to get this right or you'll be stumbling over your own difficulties the rest of your life. Well, has anybody ever tried to get you to believe something that you knew was wrong? Yeah. Now, if you keep hearing it over and over and over, it starts seeping into you if you're not offsetting that with the Word of God. Now, let me tell you, Sunday morning is not enough to offset the thoughts of the world. That's just a celebration time, but if you're not learning to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind all week long, every day, you will not be able to face the empty deceit of this world. Well, <clears throat> I think often our challenges are other believers and famous speakers and Christian authors. Here I am. <laughs> but I think you've heard me say over and over when you read my book, the Bible is not on trial. I am. You've got to have that mindset when you open a new book to read. I think more often than not, your new book ought to be another book in the Bible. Now, I'm an author. I write. Over the years, we've written, I don't know, probably 18, 19 books at this point. But there's a difference between writing from the truth of God's word and writing about what your mind wants to say and throwing a scripture on top of it. Mm -hmm. And I know this from talking to Christians. Most Christians 
cannot read a book, Christian book with the right mindset because they don't have enough word in their mind to see the faults. Okay? Nobody in this room, including me, is an exception to that. You can get enamored with an author, a Christian speaker, the guy who's on TV that attracts the largest crowds, and think because they're, quote, successful in what they're doing, they must be saying the right things. That's not true. If that were true, Jesus was a failure. Because he didn't draw the big crowds unless he had something to eat. <laughs> or they thought they might get healed. But when he had to say to his own 12, will you also go away? Or when he went to the cross, and only one of those original 12 showed up. Was he a failure? No. Far be it from that. <clears throat> Listen, I just felt like I needed to address this this morning about empty deceit. Because there are so many Christian titles released every year. Don't think you have to read the latest book because the mass is off. Read something that's founded in scripture. And if you start reading and you get in the first chapter and you see half-truths, that's what empty deceit is, half-truths. Quit reading. Go back to the scripture. There will be no half-truths there. There will be no empty deceit. I have to remind myself there's nobody more famous to me than Jesus. So guess who I ought to be reading? Now for me, I'm always reading one of the Gospels while I'm reading other things. Here's why. Can you read portions of the Bible and you not understand some of it? Yes. How do you understand something you don't understand? You run it back through the life of Jesus. People say, well, we do this in our church. Great, did Jesus? <laughs> Okay, run it through the life of Christ and you'll see truth. Let it be the evaluator for you, not who are you reading, who are you following, whose email list are you on, and who's the most popular this decade. Remember how we talked about there are words that come and go? Listen, there are men that come and go too. We come and go, but the truth will stand forever. Amen. That's where you need to put your focus on. Uh, I think often our challenges come from other believers. Because ha, Have you ever gotten in an argument over a scripture? Think about that. That's godly, isn't it? <laughs> We're going to get fighting mad over the, what this scripture says or means. Well, that just shows you that you're not walking in the Spirit. Look, just because you add the word Jesus into your conversation does not make your conversation holy. Just because you 
write something and you add the word Jesus doesn't mean it's spirit inspired. See, this is where we get into half truths. Like this. You're not supposed to judge anybody. Truth or half truth? The half truth. Why? Because we're told to judge your brother. We're told to correct them. Yeah. How about this? We're told to be fruit inspectors. You judge a tree by you gotta make a judgment. Jesus didn't say don't judge. He said don't be judgmental in your judgment. So these are the ways that we can get little half-truths in our mind. And here's what happens with that half-truth. When you confront someone to correct them because you love them and you don't want to see them go that way, if they don't like it, you know what they're going to say to you? You're not supposed to judge. And then that shuts it down. Half-truths destroy <laughs> relationships. Truth given by a spirit of love begins to correct relationships. But it doesn't always make it easy, does it? Has the Holy Spirit ever convicted you of sin? Yes. Didn't that feel wonderful? <laughs> no. It didn't in its beginnings, did it? But what was the result when you repented? Yeah, joy comes back. So, just because you speak the truth doesn't mean everybody will love it. But you don't have a right to speak the truth in hatred. You have to speak it in love for it to be proper. Oh, by the way, you can speak in love and they don't think you're very loving. <laughs> but the qualifier of whether you are loving or not is not their opinion. But what does the Holy Spirit say to you about what you just said? Let's go back to this verse again. Colossians 2.8. Now, y'all did all your assignment this week, right? So you're already experts on that chapter. I'm just giving you a little extra here to this chapter, okay? Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men. Do we live by any traditions of men? In our homes, sometimes, how about in our churches? Do we go by tradition in our churches sometimes? I remember I was uh, I was at First Baptist of West Palm Beach, Florida. It was a 10,000 member church. Every year the tradition was the singing Christmas tree. And on the singing Christmas tree, I mean, it's huge. And there's a hundred and something people in this tree singing. And it was a, it was like a two and a half hour production. <clears throat> 19 performances. Tickets, tickets, the minimum were $25. They went on sale and the first day they're in sale in Palm Beach County, they're sold out for 19 performances every year. We did see a good number of people come to know Christ. I knew some of those and saw the change in their life. But it came to this point. Do you know why we did the singing Christmas tree? We've always done it. That's Baptist words. We've always done it this way before. Or how about more like this rebellious Baptist? We've never done it this way before. <laughs> We've never done it this way before. And so we started asking the question, uh, why are we doing this? 
Did you know almost anything a church can do can have some positive outcomes? You can go on a mission trip and have positive outcomes. The question is not, can you? Did God lead you? That's the key. How about your family? You can do a lot of things in, with your family and have some positive outcomes, but is that what God was leading your family to do? Are y'all with me this morning? Okay. Yes. Richie, you're with me? Okay. <laughs> So, this scripture becomes really important because as a church, and I was a pastor, a pastor is always thinking we're always doing the right thing. I mean, a pastor is not going to intentionally say, let me see what I can do this week to mess this place up. <laughs> That's not what a pastor does. A Sunday school teacher doesn't teach and say, I'm going to go try to mess things up this morning. A deacon is not there necessarily to try and mess things up. There have been some, but that's not their role. So what's happening here? We can get to where we're confident with our traditions and make decisions based on tradition instead of the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Listen, I pastor several churches. I know this is true of us as pastors and staff looking at things. You can evaluate whether we should do this next year based on what happened this year in success. what we need to do as a church is decide what is God doing here and how can we follow what he's leading us to do well I had a staff member come in one time he said Carrie um, I need to present my budget to you for next year he was a my singles pastor and he had about 500 in his singles group and every year they went to Marco Island, took 350 singles, and had a great time over there singing, worship, playing, going to the beach. So he came in and he said, uh, here's, I need to submit my budget. And I said, well, this isn't anything different than you did last year. I said, do you, you mean to tell me that God's not led you to do anything fresh this year. I mean, it's just going to be the same thing again. Well, Carrie, that's what people like to do, and we're successful with that. So I said, well, here's your budget. Go rework it. And when you bring it back, I want you to write a description for every line item of how you know God's leading you to do that again this next year. I called it ministry-based budgeting. And I started making every staff member do that. Boy, we, we started seeing some changes around there. Now, let's, don't blame the church, let's get to us families. You got any traditions? Yeah. Some of them need to be evaluated. See, so they come out of your walk with God. Don't go through things because they're traditions. And there can be traditions you should do every year. I'm not saying that. I'm saying evaluate them to see, is Christ leading you to do that? Because if you don't get this Christ-centered in your thinking and your actions, your writing and your teaching, here's what will happen. Somebody will walk up to you and give you a new book. You should read this. And then you'll feel like, I have to read it. And then you read it and you say, here's some really good stuff in it. 
But when you really get Christ-centered, scripture-focused, then you start reading for evaluation. That's what I want you to do with the heart of the problem. I want you to read it from the view of scripture. That's the reason this morning I'm focusing on one little verse. It's the foundation of the whole chapter. And what's going to happen is you're going to start reading some things and realize there's some half-truths. But you can't evaluate and see half-truths if you only have about this much depth in the Word of God. <coughs> because you can't see it. Now, you should be growing in this. Everybody's not going to be like, I can read any book and show you anything that's right or wrong in it. No. I'm saying as you continue to walk with Christ, keep your focus on Him, not on what you're doing, not on what you're reading, and not on where you're going. Keep your focus on him. And when your focus on him gets some depth to it, then all of a sudden you're going to begin to see things with new eyes. See, here, here's what happens. The more you get into God's word, you start seeing life through your father's eyes, not yours. If you get familiar with Christ, you'll know what to do next. And it'll be satisfying. Not necessarily easy. But the out outcome will be a deepening relationship with him. Anything or anyone who moves you away from walking in the spirit is something you need to avoid. You say, well, Carrie, I have family members that tend to lead me away from walking in the spirit. And aren't we, our family is everything. Well, that's a half truth. They're not everything. Jesus is everything. You watch it on TV, you'll see it all the time. Family is everything. Do everything you have to for family. Well, not if they're not walking with God. You can try to lead them to that point, but you don't let their lifestyle influence your lifestyle. So, you need to focus on the commands of Christ because they are not empty deceit. They're full of meaning. They're full of truth. And they're going to bring you to a richer understanding of what it is to walk with him. Let's go back to some things we were talking about earlier. Has anything bad ever happened to you? Okay, it has. So how have you handled it? For some people, they just say, time heals everything. That's a half truth. Time makes it easier to live with. It doesn't get rid of it or heal it. So as we go to the book here, if sin is the problem, trauma therapy is the cure. <clears throat> If sin is the problem, then you need to go to some professional for help. Let me tell you, if sin's a problem, this room right here ought to be the best place to go to, the church, to find help. So, for you, what is the half-truth that gets you off target? Make y'all think a little bit here. This probably is not a good time for open confession. <laughs> but is there a half-truth 
you keep hearing something, you keep following something, and there's just something within you saying, it's not quite right, but I can't quite understand this. Let me tell you, the Holy Spirit does not make the Christian life complicated. You know, pray like this, God, if you'll show me your will, I'll know what to do. And then we act like it's so complicated we can't ever find his will. It's pretty easy to find if you spend enough time in his ways, his works, his truth. He begins to reveal to you what you need to be doing. Um, so let me ask you, how have you had a poor start in life? Anybody want to share? What was something that tripped you up for a while? Divorce. Divorce? Mom and dad divorced. Yeah. Asked me uh, to choose who to live with when I was five years old. Mm -hmm. me That's tough, life. isn't it? And the outcome of that. Well, for years, uh, you can't even number it, can you? Yeah. So how do people try to help you, Richard? I, don't, I didn't really talk about it for a while. Yeah. It was an internal thing where I knew I disappointed my mom and Broke my mom's heart and let down my dad because ultimately I didn't do what I said I was going to do. Yeah. But that was an adult decision. I should have never done that. Exactly. So, what got you through that bad beginning? The first thing was I, understanding that I shouldn't have been asked to make an adult decision at five years old. I was put in a place that I shouldn't have never been put in. But ultimately, that won't define my relationship with God or my parents. Yeah. They were in a, they were lost. They were doing what lost people do. The fruit of that is a lie that I was somehow responsible for choosing. Yeah. A lot of heartache you had to go through for years. Yeah. But guess what? But Christ <clears throat> came into your life, totally reevaluated your thinking, changed your thinking. So, how do you get from that to be a pastor? <laughs> I tell you, you can't do it from trauma therapy. Well, let me help, help you understand your childhood, Richie. Let me help you understand all this you went through. That will not correct his heart. That will give him more evidence to keep thinking the way he's thinking. That's all it does. See, to... Admit you're hurt, and then for someone to say, you have every right to feel that way, will keep you in bondage. I mean, if we could just add these two words real often, but Christ, the difference he makes in our thinking, our activity, <coughs> what we do next it's incredible somebody else what was your bad beginning abuse abuse physical abuse physical and verbal okay and how do you overcome it according to what was told you um they, they, I went to traditional counseling um uh I was told to talk about my trauma to um, uh, so to talk about my trauma. 
Yeah. Trauma therapy doesn't tell you how to get things corrected. It keeps helping you remember how you were wrong. It's, I was told to oftentimes that um, I was made to, to feel like uh, that I was the victim. Yeah. And I was. Well, I was a victim of abuse, um, but it kept me in bondage to that for many years. And, um, the things that began to set me free was taking ownership just because my daddy was abusive did not give me the right nor the excuse to become abusive. Yeah. So what we saw in this chapter this week related to that kind of situation, okay, he's been verbally and physically abused. His treatment was to understand he had been abused. He is a victim. There's no solution. So let's go back to this chapter. We're not talking about relief. We're talking about a cure here. That was relief to him. They did you wrong. I mean, I remember being done wrong and I became so angry. And when my friend said, Carrie, you have every right to be angry. I said, oh, tell me more. <laughs> I want to hear more of that kind of talk when I've been wronged. Why? It's going to make me more comfortable in my sin. Makes you feel better. Makes me feel better. I get some relief. But the only problem was my response to my situation. We could talk about this with Alfred too, but my response to the situation was sinful. Why is it we think when we're sinful, it's not as bad as when other people are sinful? Let me tell you what it is. Empty deceit. It's deceit without any merit. It's fake drama. Yeah. So, because I was wronged, I have a right to be angry, but they didn't have a right to be angry toward me. Let me tell you, this gets us in so much trouble. Now, why does it get us in trouble? Because our focus is not on Christ. It is on me. Yeah. And, and we've got to come to the place where he is everything to us. Look at first. 9 and 10 in Colossians 2. For in him, that is Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are incomplete in him. Is that what it says? Complete. Complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. So he's the head of everything except what you're going through. No. From Ephesians, you get this idea. Everything that's over my head is under Christ's feet. Everything I'm facing that I don't think I can face is under his feet. There's not a thing that you'll go through in this world that Christ doesn't have the right answer for. Not one. But if you're disoriented to Christ, what are you going to be thinking of? Everything about your environment, how you've been treated, how you've been raised, what's affecting me around me. If I could get Listen, if I could get all my family members to love me, if I could get all the people at work to do everything I tell them to do, <coughs> if I could get 
everybody to treat me the way I want to be treated, then I'll be a better person. Wrong. There's a problem with that. One, it's not true, but two, even if they did it, you would find a reason why somebody is wrong, but it's not you. Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? What's the answer? Only God. Now, here's what I want to leave you with. You cannot know your own heart. You can't know your own heart. You have to depend on the convicting power of the Holy Spirit to reveal your wrongs and then respond in faithful repentance over what he shows you. But you won't necessarily find it. I'll give you this example. This is, this is what I discovered years ago. I got up. I'm feeling good. Um, I went to my office. I opened my Bible. I had my quiet time. My bills were paid. Then I had a good breakfast. I thought everything's good. Y'all ever been there? until the next phone call. And all of a sudden, everything wasn't good. Okay, I thought I knew my heart when things were going well. But when the troubles in life come, it's when you really discover, am I walking with Christ? Or am I depending on myself? I don't know about you, but I want to learn how to walk with him. Yes. And today, the way I walk with him is not enough. I want to know more tomorrow. I want to go deeper and further with him than ever before. Yes. But you can't do that and leave sin in your heart justifying why it's okay. Let's pray. Lord, teach us by your spirit, how to be sensitive to truth that you reveal to us. Get our minds out of this world and into your word so that you can comfort us, guide us, convict us, teach us, and love us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would like to go back and, and listen to this again, go to the link that we will send you. And I think this week it was up uh, Sunday afternoon or Monday morning. Sunday afternoon. Sunday afternoon, it was already up. So, uh, if, you, if you would like a review, we'll try to get the link out to you a little quicker this week. But you've already got it on the links last week, if you would just go look at it. And once you watch this, this class again, do two things. Mark you like it, and subscribe to it. If out of the three classes that we have that's being uh, recorded, thank you. Out of the three classes we have, all we need is 50, and it will go live like everything else on the church's website. We just need 50 out of three classes. Some classes are not getting any subscription on subscribing to it. But there's enough in here with us that we can do it. So do that and uh, keep praying. Next week we'll have somebody else to present. So pray for whoever it's going to be next week. Uh, then the next week, the week after next, yeah, we got Hannah's going to present to us, chapter six. So that'll be it. Amen. Amen.
God bless you. She, she said you're not supposed to tell them. <laughs> Forget that. Forget Hannah's going to do it. Attendance on the six. will be up that day. On the yeah. yeah, attendance will be way up on that day. God bless you. Have a good week. Uh, week. Yes.